So today is going to talk about many of the events that have happened over the course of the past three years in Syria. He's going to talk about um, his testimony when he was affected by the chemical weapons. He's going to talk about how the Assad regime blockaded his town and prevented food and medicine from entering people who were desperately in need of assistance. Uh, but everything Kukusei is going to share is going to be just a glimpse of the past three years of a 40-year problem that we've had in Syria. The problem in Syria didn't begin just three years ago when, um, when the Assad regime started cracking down brutally on peaceful protesters. The conflict in Syria began in 1970 and 1971 when Hamza Assad rose to power through a military coup and consolidated power across all of Syria's uh, military in order to establish one of the most repressive governments that we know in modern time. Uh, it's a government that for over 40 years has had a state of emergency law, meaning that anyone can be arrested at any time for any reason. And the Assad regime used emergency law uh, in order to um, intimidate and suppress the people of Syria for over 40 years. There's not a family in, in Syria, or there are very few families in Syria that have not experienced um, the random detentions. And unfortunately, we've discovered that these people that are detained as the regime are often tortured to death and, um, and are, are executed in, in Syria's detention facilities. And many of them remain missing to this day. They've been arrested and they've been inside these detention centers for over three decades. So, um, and then of course in 1982, the Assad regime brutally crushed a uh, insurrection in the city of Hama, killing over 30,000 people. And, uh, and this, this all predates the modern understanding of the Syrian conflict. So usually when we talk about the Syrian conflict, we're talking about the past three years, we're talking about two and a half million refugees, we're talking about seven and a half million people who have been displaced, we're talking about 150,000 or more people who have been killed by chemical weapons, by barrel bombs, by tanks and snipers, and everything in between. <clears throat> but the problem in Syria dates back to 40 years, and that's why it's very important to always realize that in order to resolve the problem in Syria, you have to trace back all the way to the root of the problem which is the Assad regime itself in its current form. Uh, Hossein Zakaria is a um, prominent activist in Syria. He became internationally known for launching a hunger strike in the end of last year. Uh, this hunger strike lasted for 33 days. It gained international uh, recognition with many um, with many very highly acclaimed people taking part in the hunger strike, such as the executive director of Human Rights Watch, Ken Roth, such as Congressman Keith Ellison, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Noam Chomsky as well, uh, <clears throat> uh, who, who all fasted in solidarity with Jose. And Jose was uh, sending a message to the world that there are people in Syria that are starving to death, not because there isn't food in Syria, but there is food in Syria. The food is only two minutes away from the people. But people are starving to death in Syria, and, and I'm talking about women and children starving to death in Syria because the Assad regime deliberately prevents food from reaching civilian populations. So uh, Hussein started a hunger strike. He gained inter international notoriety for doing so. And he's here with us today to share his stories after miraculous escape from Damascus, from uh, the town of Maldamiya, and we're extremely lucky and honored uh, to have him here with us. Without any further ado, uh, our good friend, Jose Zakaria. Good evening, everybody, and thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Jose. I recently came from Syria almost a month ago. Uh, I came from a town in the west of, the, of Damascus called Maldamit Sham. Uh, Maldamit Sham is a very small and strategical town the, uh, in, uh, in the same time. 
uh, because it's right next to the Mesa Military Air Base, which is the headquarter of the Air Force Intelligence, one of the biggest uh, uh, intelligent branches that the Assad regime has in Syria. And it's also right next to uh, the Fourth Division headquarters, uh, which is a big military division run by Maher al-Assad, the brother of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, Muhammad al-Sham uh, participated in the uprising against the Assad regime since the very beginning of the Syrian revolution. Uh, the first demonstration happened in Moldonia uh, was on March 21st, uh, 2011. Uh, the Assad regime didn't uh, hesitate for a second to use all his uh, power trying to uh, frighten people from demonstrating against him. So he sent his intelligence patrols uh, to, sh uh, to shoot at the peaceful demonstrations. Uh, they arrested young men, uh, tortured them in the middle of the streets, uh, sometimes they uh, torture young men or uh, olders and throw them in garbage cans uh, and ask them to stay there until uh, they have the permission uh, to get out or they will arrest their families. They went inside people's houses and they raped women in front of their families, trying to terrify them. Uh, they executed people in the middle of the streets, uh, again trying to terrify people and stop them from demonstrating against the Assad regime. And while we were asking for international protection for the peaceful demonstrations during the first eight months of uh, the Syrian revolution, and nobody did anything to help us, uh, some young, uh, young men in Moldavia decided to uh, raise weapons to defend uh, the town and defend their families. Uh, and they got some shotguns and some AK-47 and they started to stand against the Assad intelligence patrols and the Assad regime responded in invading Moldavia twice using full military equipment, tanks and choppers, bombed the town with land missiles and artillery and they killed over 450 people during these two invasions. Most of them were butchered by knives or they would have been uh, burned alive in the middle of the streets. Uh, and again trying to frighten people uh, and stop them from continuing with the Syrian revolution and they wrote their famous lines uh, with the victim's blood like uh, it's either Assad or we will burn the country it's one of the most famous models that the Assad mercenaries used to uh, send a message across Syria uh, that if people will continue with the uprising they will burn Syria literally uh, after the second invasion, and again after uh, the international community failed again to uh, protect the civilians in Moldavia and other places in Syria as well, uh, people in Moldavia got it again, and they decided to raise more money to get more weapons and to establish uh, a strong uh, FSA division, Free Syrian Army Division, to defend the town and defend the families, uh, the remaining families. Uh, after uh, 55,000 people uh, from Moldavia were forced to be displaced because of the Assad violence. They were bombing the town, sending uh, car bombs to Moldavia. They sent over 13 uh, car bombs to Moldavia, which is a big number for a small city like Moldavia. And after we managed to establish uh, the Free Syrian Army Division in Moldavia, and they managed to stand against the Assad invasion attempts, the Assad regime uh, shut off all the uh, Yani, all the roads to Moldavia, they put the town under complete siege at the end of November 2012. Uh, they stopped each and everybody from coming in or out to Moldavia. Anybody who tried to do that, they would either get shot by the Assad snipers or worse, to get captured and more, uh, tortured to death. Uh, personally, I uh, helped bury a lot of these civilians who were trying to come in or out to Moldavia. Uh, one of the most touching stories, maybe, it was for a, uh, a man called Abu Muhammad. He was in the age of 42. He was working in Damascus uh, before the siege started, and he had his wife and a little girl at the age of seven, uh, she, and she had medical uh, and health issues, and she needed a special kind of medicine. <coughs> wasn't available in Moldavia, especially after the Assad regime destroyed the three hospitals that we used to have in Moldavia, and we only had. Uh, the uh, field hospital, uh, which is a basement in a building, uh, eight, only eight doctors for 13,500 people remaining in Moldavia after the beginning of the siege. 
So uh, Muhammad tried to get the medicine to his daughter in January 2013. Uh, he got captured by the Assad uh, intelligence. Uh, they tortured him to death and they burned his body and they throw his body in the nearby road of Maldamia in the northern side of the town and they uh, left a note over his dead body saying this is what's going to happen to anybody who's going to try to come in or out to Maldamia and again they signed the note with uh, their famous motto it's either Assad or we will burn the country. Uh, again we were asking the international community, uh, the United Nations, the ICRC at least, to enter uh, some humanitarian aid to Maldamia because we only had the uh, basic uh, food supplies that people in country towns usually store, like rice and uh, sugar and spaghetti, uh, and some homemade supplies like uh, mangoes, which is a, a famous uh, kind of food in, uh, in, the, in Syria. Uh, but nothing happened and we were left to face our ugly destiny uh, facing the Assad shelling and bombardment uh, on daily basis uh, until uh, August 21st, 2013 when the Assad regime used sarin gas to attack Maldamia and also the eastern Ruta. I was one of the people who got exposed with the chemical attack and my heart stopped for three minutes and I was placed among the deceased for almost 45 minutes. Uh, I was up doing my pressure prayer around 4.45 a.m. when I started hearing terrifying alarms coming from Damascus. The kind of alarms that we usually hear in movies about World War II when there's a big air raid or something like this. Uh, I started hearing rockets flying into low distance to the ground and before realizing what was going on, I, I lost my ability to breathe or even uh, to scream to alert my friends. So I started beating my chest over and over until I managed to get my first breath. And I started screaming to alert my friends and uh, who were staying with me in, in the apartment. And we started uh, hearing the neighbors screaming and yelling as well. Uh, they were confused and terrified. And they didn't know what was going on. While, while we were getting dressed, one of our neighbors knocked on our door and she had two of her kids one of the age of four and the other one in the age of six. Both of them were suffocating and vomiting uh, weird white stuff from, uh, from their mouths. So uh, the minute I saw them, I knew that it was a chemical attack. She was begging us for help. And one of my friends in the Brazilian army had a car. And he told me that we should go get it and try to get as much civilians as we can to the field hospital. So we went to the street and the scene was so terrifying. I always use the ex expression of Judgment Day because we all hear stories how confusing and terrifying it will be for people to see all this going on without knowing what's happening. People were running, women and children, older and men, falling on the ground, suffocating, without seeing a single drop of blood. Nobody had a clue what was going on. Uh, it got into my attention that a small kid at the age of 13 was laying on the ground almost 50 meters away from me and nobody was close to help him. So I went to check on him and I think uh, the expression that he had on his face was one of the most terrifying images that I've seen during the Syrian revolution even though I saw a lot of horrible and terrifying images. He had a big white blue eyes and he was almost staring into another dimension while he was suffocating. He seemed too innocent to die this way or in any other way. He was almost dying without knowing what he did wrong to die this way. I tried to give him CPR and I was screaming and asking for help uh, until my friend managed to get his car. He had like six uh, children and three ladies exposed and there was no room for us, but I insisted. So I got the kid in the trunk of the car and we went to the field hospital. And the minute we arrived at the field hospital, the scene was even more terrifying because hundreds and hundreds of people were exposed. The minute my friend stopped the car and I was trying to get up, I went unconscious and I went around. My friends took me to the field hospital and at that time my heart stopped and the doctors tried to give me CPR and gave me a shot of atropine uh, and tried to get my heart working again for almost three minutes. But 
there was no use, so they placed me along the deceased. Until over 45 minutes later, one of my friends who were, uh, was helping rescue civilians saw me laying with the deceased, and he came and started crying and shaking me until he noticed that I was still moving. He got the doctors again, and they gave me extra shots of atropine and CPR and washed my body over and over with water until I came back to conscious almost 30 minutes later. When I went back to conscious, I was standing in the middle of the street, uh, right next to the field hospital, wearing nothing but my underwear, uh, covered and filled with water, and the Assad regime was bombing the town like World War II, and they were trying to invade the town. They had uh, brand new Russian tanks called T-82, uh, and uh, they used unbelievable amount of power. They used brand new Russian and Iranian missiles with the ability to, of destruction. They had their special forces dressed up in full chemical gear, and they were trying to invade really hard. It was another miracle for the Philistine army to stand against them and prevent them from invading Baltimore because like I told you, uh, most of the Philistine army in Baltimore are young men from the town who are defending their own families and they knew if they managed to enter, they won't leave a breathing soul in Baltimore. Five days later, after the chemical attack, the United Nations of Inspectors team came to Baltimore even though the Assad regime shot at their vehicles and they bombed the town while they were trying to enter, trying to frighten them and uh, scare them away, but they were brave enough to enter. Maldemia was the first town they managed to uh, enter. Uh, they went inside the town and I escorted them, taking advantage of my English skills uh, to provide accurate information and description about what happened. They went to the field hospital, they examined patients, they took blood samples and tissues, they went to the crashing zones and also examined some of the rockets that the Assad regime used to launch the chemical attack. And they wrote a full report after they also uh, visited Eastern Wota. And in their report that they provided to the United Nations and Security Council, it was obvious that the Assad regime who used the chemical weapons, I always uh, remind people about this uh, details because every once and then we hear different stories about members of Al Qaeda or guys from Turkey or sometimes uh, aliens from Mars who used the, the chemical weapons to attack the Damascus suburbs on August 21st. So we were too busy waiting for the so called military strike that President Obama promised to do, and obviously he did nothing. Uh, and nobody was paying enough attention for the malnutrition symptoms that started to spread all over the town uh, after all the, uh, yeah, the homemade supplies of food ran up from Maldamia and we only had olives and leaves of trees to survive on. Maldamia is famous for their uh, olive trees and uh, we, wasn't, we wasn't able even to plant anything except of some simple herbs like broca uh, in Maldamia because the Assad regime were bombing all the places that we were trying to plant anything to use to survive on. Nobody again did anything at least to enter humanitarian aid to Maldamia. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the international media didn't uh, start paying attention until we started losing uh, women and children in Maldamia from malnutrition. They starved to death. Uh, I personally knew uh, a small girl called Rena Obeid in the age of 18, this is Rena. Uh, she was 18 months old when she died because she, uh, we didn't have child's milk in, in Maldamia. I used to know, uh, know her father, his name was Obilad. He used to have a grocery store and his, uh, her mother uh, used to be a teacher. So imagine how uh, sad and pathetic it is to hear a story about a man who used to have a grocery store and he lost his daughter <coughs> because, uh, of the lack of food. And this is happening in the 21st century. Uh, we managed to get some uh, attention, like I told you after. Uh, we started losing people in Maldamia from malnutrition and uh, put some media pressure, at least on the Assad regime, to allow humanitarian aids to enter. But the Assad regime responded in evacuating people from Maldamia. 
instead of allowing uh, humanitarian aid. Uh, and the Assad regime got a lot of help from the notorious nun, Agnes Mariam, who was working as a media propaganda, uh, yeah, as a media spokesperson for the Assad regime, and she was helping, helping them with their media propaganda. Uh, we, they evacuated around 4,500 uh, civilians from Montamia. Most of them were women and children, uh, some older and some wounded civilians as well. Most of them got arrested and interrogated in the military air base. Uh, a lot of people got executed. Hundreds of people are still missing until these days. Uh, a lot of women got raped. And uh, I remember when people were getting out from Montamia in October 2013 during the evacuations, and I was asking them, how can, you know, how can you risk your life and go out this way? And their simple answer was, we stop, we prefer to uh, die on, on an empty, uh, on a full stomach than to die on an empty stomach. And yeah, you know, people were desperate in unimaginable, you know, in a way that you cannot even imagine. After you know, almost two and a half years from suffering and seeing all the war just looking uh, the other way. Uh, again, we were trying to talk with the United Nations, with, uh, with ICRC, sometimes with the members from the State Department of the United States, uh, trying to uh, have any kind of pressure on the Assad regime to allow humanitarian aid, but nothing happened and people were only suffering more and more in Maltamiya and other besieged towns in Syria. It wasn't just Maltamiya, we had Daria, we had Eastern Ruta, uh, uh, a Muk refugee camp uh, in Damascus, uh, most of uh, the old city in Homs, uh, a lot of places in Hama and Idlib, over 1.5 million people were starving to death in Syria and they are still starving to death in Syria until these days. So I decided to do a hunger strike at the end of 2013 to raise awareness against the Assad starvation weapon and uh, it seemed to me that doing a hunger strike will get more attention from international media because hearing a story about the guy doing the hunger strike in a uh, start town uh, was more interesting for them to hear stories about uh, civilians starving in these besieged towns and unfortunately that was true and we managed to get a lot of attention after a lot of amazing people and activists all over the world helped us with the uh, hunger strike and they started doing solidarity hunger strikes for Syria and all of that wasn't enough for anybody to step ahead and do anything to help uh, the starving civilians in Syria. Storm Alexa came uh, and hit uh, Syria and the Middle East and Maldamia as well uh, in the end of 2013 and it only uh, put more fuel on our supper. People were starving to death and uh, freezing to death at the, at the same time. And we were forced to sign up for a so-called truce with the Assad regime in the end of 2013 uh, with a lot of uh, humiliating conditions lot, uh, like raising the Assad flag over Montania and also hand over weapons which is our only guarantee for safety and activists, descent officers and soldiers and returns of entering small shipments of food and that we had to pay a lot of money to, to have it coming into Maldamiya. Again, we are paying a lot of money to get uh, the aid into Maldamiya, which is supposed to be free, coming from the United Nations and ICRC. Uh, I managed to get up from uh, Maldamiya during uh, February, during Geneva talks, when I got an offer from the Chief of Staff of the 4th Division, Hassan al uh, he's the Secretary of Mahd al-Assad, uh, he offered me to go outside to Damascus and have a talk face to face, uh, and in return I will have freedom of choice. I went outside because it was my only option after I stopped feeling secure in Maldamia after the so-called truce, the Assad regime was able to uh, arrest me at any second. Uh, and my situation was so complicated inside of the town. So it was a big gamble, but I had to take it. I went outside and I met with him in the Fourth Division headquarters. And he was trying to convince me to start working for the Assad regime uh, and start telling my media contacts 
that everything is going on uh, uh, in a good way right now in Mautamia, because during Geneva, the world was watching closely about what's happening in the besieged towns, and especially the towns that sign up for the so-called truce. Uh, they were trying to convince me uh, yeah, yeah, while they were playing a good cop and bad cop scenario with me. They were trying to tell me that the Assad army is the only guarantee for order in Syria and they were forced to fight with the uh, free Syrian <coughs> army because of the Assad intelligence. So the Assad intelligence were playing the bad cop in this play. Uh, I had to be really smart and calm to convince him that I might say yes for this offer. And in return, they promised me that I will be safe and they will secure my family. And also, I will get whatever I want, uh, just if I start working with them. Uh, five days later, after I had the talk, I was staying in the Damas Rose Hotel in Damascus. They sent an intelligent patrol to my room. Uh, they got me out of the room, they beat the crap out of me, and they wanted to arrest me. And then suddenly the 4th Division came and they rescued me, trying to convince me even more that what they, are, what they said is true. After that, I asked uh, Hassan Abdad to go to Lebanon to see my family and my media contacts, because most of them are based in uh, Beirut, like uh, CNN and the New York Times and Washington Post, all of these reporters are based in Beirut and covering Syria. And if I was talking to them face to face in Beirut, they will believe me while talking to them from Damascus will show them that I've been uh, forced to talk and they won't believe me. And alhamdulillah, it was stupid enough to believe me. <laughs> and uh, he asked me to get a fake ID because I'm uh, I'm not going to be able to use my own ID to cross the borders because I'm wanted for the intelligence and they cannot control their own intelligence. So I got a fake ID for a guy who doesn't even look like me. Uh, maybe Kinan looks more like him <laughs> than he looks like me. Uh, and <coughs> it was another gamble for me that I had to take. Uh, and they got me through their own intelligence checkpoints. I mean, I arrived to the Lebanese security officer. Uh, I was so lucky and blessed to have him talking to his friend while he was about to identify me, while he was uh, filling the application. So it was more like Ben Affleck in Argo, I guess. <laughs> and I managed to escape in an unbelievable way. Uh, I'm here again to share my stories and testimonies about what's going on in Syria. Uh, I want to thank you all again for coming here, but I want to remind you and remind myself that we all should be more involved uh, in the Syrian revolution and helping the Syrian people. It's not just, uh, yeah, you know, it's not just enough to uh, attend uh, events and do some talking with your friends. We want to have people more involved because after three years of uh, suffering in Syria, uh, the Syrian people deserve to have your support and your attention. And again, thank you so much and God bless you. Uh, I'm going to play a couple of videos. Uh, it was taken from me in Maltamiya and maybe it will give you more of the story that I was trying to tell you. I'll start.
حالت هيك يا ابني عارفة هلا اللي عم بحكي اني عم بشغل بس صوتي ما عم يطلع خشي هيك صرخت بدي عم صرخ هيك صوتي ما عم يطلع عارفة شوي طلع صوت اطلع لبرا الله اكبر الله تشوفوني اياه بتصل انا بتصل بعدين صار ايش صار يصير حولي؟ يا طفلت مرة ثانية شفت هيك بياض بعدين حسيت حالي قوي من هون هي وقفت ومشيت ثلاثة صار بس مشيت ثلاثة وسبعين بعدين زنتوني بعدين الحمد لله so this video was taken for me my friend almost uh, two days later after I was exposed with the chemical attack I was trying to remember what happened with me uh, because every once and then I started remembering what was going on while I was unconscious, like I had things uh, coming back, like flashbacks sometimes. And again, there is no words to describe what happened in August 21st. Uh, it's really disgusting and pathetic to see the world just looking the other way about the chemical massacre in Syria about killing over 150,000 people, thousands of people being tortured to death, and all of that is not enough to have some dignity in this world to take actions against the uh, fascist uh, regime in Syria. Uh, the second video is a short one. Like, I'm announcing 
a hunger strike, and I'm asking all the decent humans all around the world to raise their voices and put some pressure upon their governments to make serious acts to stop this brutal siege. Please break the siege on the rebel towns in Syria. Hussein Zakaria, Mohamed Sham, 25-11-2013. This is the annunciation of the hunger strike. Uh, I chose this spot because, as you can see behind me, this is the uh, simple herbs that they were trying to plant to survive on. I was holding in my hand the olives and the leaves of trees and the herbs that we were using to survive for over seven months. And right behind me, the destroyed building used to be a kindergarten, uh, which got destroyed by the Assad uh, land missiles. Over 25 children and seven teachers died uh, in that kindergarten. We were trying to make activities uh, to have uh, children back to school, uh, to have any kind of activity that will remind them about their childhood. But again, the Assad regime knows no limits to stop on. And we had to stop these activities. And <coughs> right beneath me, there was, uh, or used to be, uh, the Zaytuna Mosque. It was the first mosque uh, that people started to demonstrate from. And also, it was the first a mosque that the Assad regime bombed and they sent two car bombs to uh, Zaytuna Mosque and it got, it got completely destroyed. So, uh, I'm going to remind myself and remind you again that it's not enough to just attend events and then uh, come back home. We all should be more involved. And again, thank you all for coming. Okay, before we open up for questions, uh, I, want, I want to show you um, one thing that you can do next Tuesday uh, in order to help people in Syria, specifically from the rebel uh, besieged towns that Jose was talking about. So um, we're having a call. So there's an important piece of legislation which will be uh, under review at the House Foreign Affairs Committee next Wednesday, April 30th. Um, and we need as much support for this resolution from uh, across the country as possible in order to make sure that this bill does make it past the House Foreign Affairs Committee and onto the floor of the House. Um, the, the bill is sponsored by Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, Ed Royce from California. And so I'm going to show you how you can go to our Facebook page uh, and get the information about this calling campaign. So the uh, address, I'm going to put it up right now, is facebook.com slash essay council. Um, and Jose will, <coughs> Jose will also put the information up 
uh, on his uh, Facebook as well. So hopefully you took down the information for his uh, blog and his uh, Twitter account. So uh, with that, we're going to open it up for questions. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I'm so moved. I'm, I'm so horrified. I mean, this is the shame of the world. And um, I'm very, very sorry for what you've been through. Um, excuse me. I have two quick questions. Um, one was, it was very interesting what you said, that the, the 4th Brigade was sort of negotiating with you while the intelligence was after you. And I was wondering if there's sort of any hope in that, in that maybe there, some of the regime apparatuses, they have different priorities. And, and maybe there's something some hope there. And my second quick question is um, how uh, p politicians in Washington have been receiving you, if, if, if you feel like they've been taking you seriously, and, and if perhaps there are other allies outside of Washington, D.C. that can maybe do more or help more um, in Europe or, or elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for being in touch with you. It's always amazing to see people caring about Syria while they are on the other side of the planet. And we were just having a lot of people who were sitting right next to us just looking the other way. Uh, as a start, like I told you, the Assad regime was just making a maneuver and playing a good cop and bad cop scenario. Uh, the 4th Division is uh, responsible for most of the invasions that happened in uh, Damascus suburbs and in Homs as well. Uh, the famous Malabar mass massacre was attempted by the 4th Division. Uh, and they were trying to convince me uh, that they do not control their own intelligence. And right now, the 4th Division, during the past month, they started to bomb Mautamiya again, uh, because uh, this, uh, some of the aid that we are having in, in to Mautamiya, <coughs> we are giving it to the civilians of Daria, that the regime is trying to uh, pressure them using barrel bombs and the starvation weapon as well to sign up for a similar truce uh, with Mautamiya, so they're not innocent and they are just playing just disgusting at play. And as for uh, meeting politicians, uh, to be honest, there is, uh, there is a lot of people inside of the U.S. government uh, who are not happy and uh, they are very pissed from Obama's calls. Uh, most of them are in the State Department uh, and especially Mrs. Samantha Power. Uh, she wrote an entire book about the genocide in Bosnia. And uh, in her book, she explains how the United States played uh, some uh, maneuvers uh, to escape uh, the responsibilities in taking actions to stop ge the genocide. And when I met her, she told me that what's going on right now is very similar to what was uh, happening in Bosnia. Uh, unfortunately, when the genocide happened in Bosnia, it took a lot of uh, officials in the uh, American government to uh, resign so they could embarrass uh, the American administration to start acting and right now uh, the only uh, politician maybe that resigned uh, you know, in, uh, because he was unhappy with the way uh, the American government was uh, acting about Syria was Fred Hoff, the special ambassador for Syria and that's why I'm asking all people to get more involved and to do more uh, to support the Syrian people and also to address their, uh, the, the U.S. government. And inshallah, if we manage to work together, we will be able to do that. Right now, alhamdulillah, most of them 
got up from Syria. Um, I'm also trying to uh, secure the rest. Uh, we had a lot of people who sacrificed their families and their friends and themselves and the sake of the Syrian revolution and the sake of uh, building a free Syria. And I'm not better than any of them. We all have to make sacrifices. And freedom is uh, something really valuable and it's worth uh, all the danger would will uh, happen. So it's part of the revolution to have this kind of risks. And I'm more than happy to do it. intervention by intervention I mean like putting boots on like Syrian soil do you feel that would help or that just make the situation more chaotic we don't want to see any uh, Iraqi scenario happening again or uh, Afghani scenario happening again in Syria we don't want to see American soldiers in Syria to make things even more complicated we are asking for no flight zone in Syria uh, some military strikes on uh, the Assad bases to stop them from using uh, scout missiles and uh, other kind of weapons and of course chemical <coughs> weapons. Uh, during the past month the Assad regime started using uh, chlorine gas again. Uh, they hit uh, a lot of places in Damascus suburbs and homes and Idlib uh, using chlorine gas. Chlorine gas was uh, first used by Hitler in World War II and right now the Assad regime is using chlorine gas to uh, yeah, I mean, to kill more civilians in Syria. Uh, I think having an off-flight zone and some limited military strikes and supporting the free Syrian army who is fighting both of the Assad regime and Al-Qaeda at the same time will be very helpful and useful. Uh, believe me, when uh, after the chemical attack and while we were waiting for the so-called military strike that Obama, Obama promised to do, we had a lot of resources inside of the Assad regime who was starting to tell us that a lot of officials and superiors in the Assad government were thinking about fleeing Syria. So we were this close to uh, take the Assad regime down if the uh, military strike happened. And inshallah, it will happen sooner or later. Anybody else? Yes. The role of the Iranian and the Hezbollah inside Syria is it making the, I mean, how, how does it play on the ground itself? I mean, we hear it from outside, but on the inside, how is the population perceiving this invasion by the Iranian and by Hezbollah, which is the militias coming from Iraq and Iran and Lebanon, and yet the West doesn't see this one as an invasion of Syria from outside world. But I wanna see, I wanna hear what the inside is saying about this. Uh, well, and like I told you, uh, we are facing a brutal regime uh, and he has a lot of support from his allies, from Hezbollah, from Iran, from Iraq, from Russia, uh, supporting them with weapons, fighters and uh, logistic support as well. Uh, people are seeing this as a new invasion, uh, like I told you. The, you know, the Christian army is fighting both of the Assad regime and these mercenaries, and they are also fighting Al Qaeda. We have a lot of enemies. We have a lot of uh, evil powers in Syria who are trying to, uh, <coughs> yeah, they kill our dream in having a free, a free Syria. But inshallah, if we manage to get some support, we will be able to have our victory. This is all I can say. The following question is. Free Syria will come eventually, in soon, inshallah, but maybe five years, ten years. How do you perceive the relationship between the Syrian people themselves and those countries who sponsor to come and help the Assad regime? Is it going to be a boycott, or is well, it going to be... As a start, there's a big difference between governments and people. Yani, uh, we have fighters coming from Lebanon, from Hezbollah, but we have a lot of good friends in Lebanon. We have uh, fighters coming from Iraq, but we have a lot of good friends in Iraq. And also in Iran, uh, there was an attempt to have a revolution in Iran, if you remember, in 2010, maybe? 2009, 
uh, they were trying to take down the Khamenei regime. Uh, so we don't have problems with uh, the people. We only have problems with governments uh, and also Putin's government as well and in Russia. They are also supporting the Assad regime. While there is a lot of people who are against uh, this kind of intervention, we only have problems with governments. We don't have problems with people. So uh, during the future, we will uh, judge on this on these countries uh, uh, on the way that their own governments are acting. But I can say that uh, there is a lot of hate against uh, this kind of intervention coming from these countries. And I, I don't think that the Syrian people will be able to forgive easily all what they did in Syria. Yes? And it, honestly, it's a pleasure to be here in a room with you. And I feel really honored um, being here after you have such a powerful and moving story. Um, when it comes to Syria, I've never been so disgusted with the Arab community uh, when it comes to their responses and their inaction. Um, and so I was wondering, as a, a Palestinian, as Syrian, Lebanese, whatever, um, when you're in this country, I mean, you can put up petitions and force governments all you want, but that doesn't change the situation of the people in Syria right now who are literally starving and suffering from this massive collective punishment from the Assad regime. So what are some good nonprofit organizations that are delivering fast aid that we can donate to that you've seen firsthand are actually changing the condition of Syrian people on the ground? Uh, any names of organizations would be great. 
um, so that we can go back to our activist communities and tell them like these are the a these are actually making a difference here. Well, first of all, the honor and the pleasure is mine. And uh, like you said, it's disgusting to see how the uh, our governments are uh, dealing with the uh, uh, civil revolution. We have some uh, good countries who are trying to help. And unfortunately, they were also stopped by Obama's administration. They were planning to do a lot of support for Syria, like Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, and even Turkey. Uh, but again, there is a big question when it comes about the calls taken by the uh, Obama's administration. Uh, when it comes about the organization that can uh, help people inside of Syria, we have a new day for Syria. Uh, which is a non-profit organization working uh, to support uh, the Syrian people in Syria. They are doing an amazing work. We have... Uh, we have Karam Foundation as well, who... Uh, what do you recommend? Okay, we have also Syrian Sunrise Foundation I'm not familiar with the names of the organizations because like I tried to explain to you, uh, we didn't, you know, we weren't able to have any kind of assistance <coughs> in Maab Damia, so I never deal with any of these organizations personally, but uh, these three organizations that I just told you about are highly recommended because I've talked with a lot of people inside of Syria and they told me that they are doing an amazing uh, work and inshallah anybody who will donate money or anything else it will be delivered for the people who really need it